when God gave the nations the church he gave that nation the answer to their problems because God's kingdom is not just a spiritual place what you don't know is that God's kingdom is a country there's power in knowledge there's power in information there's power in knowing something if you know what has been written concerning health it is easy to claim healing if you know what has been written concerning finance it is easy to claim wealth if you know what has been written concerning business you, there are words in the scriptures that have you run to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abba brings you God's word with deep insight and power. God bless you. Hallelujah. Project that scripture. The name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous run it into it and he say, I just want to pick something. We have 10 minutes and we'll be out of the service. Project it. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Is what uh, the devil is doing in this end time. Um, um, amen. We are still going to pray a few minutes of prayer. Uh, if you find it, you put it up. But before you get there, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You may sit down one minute only is what I ask for, you know. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip on what I... Uh, the series on finance and all that. Because there's something I'm asking God. Why, 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 why? Okay, let me read Ecclesiastes. And after that, you show that scripture, the name of the Lord is a strong power. Verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your what? Can we read it together? I want to go. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Verse 2, want to go. Why the sun and the light the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain i pray god gives you interpretation of um i i only pray god gives you interpretation of what i want to show you now verse three want to go in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down when the grinders cease because they are few and those that look through the windows grow dim verse 4 want to go when the doors are shut in the street and the sound of grinding is low when one rises up at the sound of a bed and all the daughters of music are brought low let's read verse 5 one to go also they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way when the almond tree blossoms the grasshopper is a body and desire fails for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets Let's read verse 6. One, two, go. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Verse 7. One, two, go. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God. Who gave it? 
vanity one to go vanity of vanities says the preacher all is vanity a wise man is not known by the multiple questions he's able to answer a wise man is first known by the multiple number of questions he's able to ask you don't know a wise man first by the answers he can you know the answers he gives to questions those days in school when they ask questions the smartest were seen to be the ones who can answer I found out when I was in school, I did more of asking questions than even answering. Because any question you can answer is proof of something you know. But for every one knowledge you have, there's a billion knowledge you don't have. You see, all the things you know in this world is a percentage out of so many things you don't know. Let me give an example. You went to school. I don't know what you studied. Most of you are in school. Most of you are done with school. Whatever you studied in school, no matter how good you are in it, is just one segment of the whole body of knowledge. So that I studied medicine in school and I graduated with a distinction does not mean I know everything that is in life. Medicine is all I know. So carry me as a professional medical doctor and put me inside a law court and ask me to defend somebody. There's no defense I'm going to bring because I don't know anything about the law. I may know one or two things in the Constitution. That does not mean I'm an expert at law. That doesn't mean I'm a professional lawyer. So the man who is boasting that he knows so much it's actually a big fool. Because no matter what you know, there's still so much more you don't know. There will always be much you don't know compared to what you know. I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying. I said, there will always be much you don't know compared to what you think you know. That's why life is a growing process. That's why life is a learning process. Someone said, the reason we have another day is for self-improvement. The reason we have a new day is to turn a new leaf. There's something you used to know. You think that is all that is. When a new day comes, you find that that knowledge is expired. You will now need new knowledge. That's why you have new days. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about the importance of knowledge or the importance of information. How you know a wise man it's not by the questions he's able to answer. If you answer a question correctly now, you already know the answer. So sometimes people clap for the guys who answer questions. Ah, he's too intelligent, he's too intelligent, he's too intelligent, he's too intelligent. Okay, let me do this little illustration. One plus one is what? Two. Did you struggle to answer that? You already know it. So why should he impress me? Why should I clap for her? Two plus two is what? Should I now clap for her? You see what the school did to us? When we answer questions correctly, we clap. Not this guy, no book. Three plus three is what? Okay, answer this one. X minus X plus 4 raised to power 2 equals to x. Find x. Answer it. She can't answer that one. She doesn't know it. Watch. Let me show you something in the Bible. Jesus was in the temple. You know, professors of the Bible, professors of, you know, in the temple, were teaching. And the Bible said that Jesus was asking questions. He wasn't contributing. He wasn't answering questions. 
he was asking what he was asking what then what happened the professors of the scriptures were all marveled the bible said they were all astonished at the manner of questions he asked So I found that that intelligence is not rated by questions you are answering. It's rated by questions you are asking. You want to know the intelligent guy in the class? He's the one who is asking the right question. Because what I know is not of value. It's the things I don't know. That's what will kill you. It's the ones that I know. It's the ones that I know. It's the ones that I know. The ones that I don't know, rather, that is capable of killing you. The ones I know has been taken care of. So when I'm dealing with ignorance now, I'm dealing with a bigger issue. <laughs> so, I'm that kind of a person who asks questions. I don't observe things happen around me and then keep quiet about it. When I see successions of things going on, I start asking questions. Why? 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 You see, wise men, they ask questions, what? They ask questions that begins with why. They ask questions that begin with how. You see all those seven magical questions, what? Why? How? When? Who? Where? You see those questions? If it's not on your lips, you're heading to your grave faster than you know. I come into a place like this now and I discover one door is open. All these other doors are locked. You always hear me ask question, why are all these doors locked? I must ask. Why are these doors locked? Because I want to know why. <laughs> There's a reason we read the scriptures, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I want to show you the reason. Have you observed this is going to be the shortest message I'll preach, but maybe the most powerful. Go home with it and ponder on it. Because nothing just happens, my friends. And then, for everything that happens, there is an answer to every question. There is no question in life that does not have an answer. There is an answer to every question. There is an answer to every question. There is an answer to every question. And then you see this book we, we carry around. Most of you think it's just a religious book. This thing called Bible. It has all the answers to the questions of man. Oh, a chemistry book may not have it. Your physics book may not have it. Your medical books may not have all the answers. But I found out the scriptures have all the answers to the question of man. Nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. Recently, I've been observing a trend amongst young people now. It seems like the devil is on the loose. Everywhere. Youths are dying anyhow. Everywhere. Young boys, young girls. People who should be getting to the ripen, you know, stage of their dream and whatever. They are out. And when those things happen, you know, religion has killed some people. People say things like, well, we can't ask God why. I ask him why. This God who says, come, let us reason together, must be answering questions. If you know how to engage him, you can't ask God why. No, it doesn't mean you are judging God. Okay, something happens and you expect me to keep my mouth quiet. I have a father in heaven who has the answer to all the questions in life. And then the answers are even in the scripture. Sometimes I search the scripture, I don't get, okay, I have the Holy Ghost in me. Who I can even speak with. Holy Ghost, I, I need you to show me why are these things happening. God, please, can you show me why are these things happening? What's going on? Is it a problem of mass ignorance amongst young people? Or is it a problem of, what is it? What's really going on? Where is a problem coming from? Because if you find the problem is going, you're going to arrest it in time. And God has shown me a couple of things in my 
quiet time sometimes I just ponder and ask these questions. Young people. This afternoon I saw one on Facebook. It's everywhere. A young boy I know collected by accident. Why? Just like that. I saw another one this same afternoon. A lady, three children, a whole family involved in an accident died. They were buried today. Whole family. And I asked myself, why? There are. I've seen some people who give testimonies in church. I entered a vehicle and the Holy Ghost told me, come down. I felt an unrest in this vehicle. And I heard a voice telling me, leave this vehicle. And I obeyed. I came down. few minutes after, or a few hours after, I took another bus. Just reaching, I saw that same vehicle perish. Everybody died. Then I said, okay, God, you minister to this other one. They got saved. Why didn't you minister to this other one? And I found out something. God doesn't speak except you have created an atmosphere where he can talk. It's a simple thing. I don't know where to even start from this evening. But that's not even my focus. I'm not here to talk to you about divine guidance, about uh, you know, being led of the Holy Ghost. That's not the thing. There are many things I ask God and he bombards my mind with a lot of things. Sometimes we ask questions like, ah, this guy is a Christian, that lady is a Christian. What happened? And then God starts showing me all kinds of things and then I'm like, Okay, how do I now tidy up these things, compress it, maybe into a series and start showing the people? But let me not bore you with so much. I just want to show you one God showed me. Do you want to be saved from the nonsense going on in this age? I'm going to show you just one. There are a lot of things I can show you. But one is what I'm going to show you. And that's all. We'll leave. You know, there's some news you hear, you, you become afraid for yourself. You become scared. Well, I have good news for you. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of boldness and what? A sound mind. There's a kind of man and woman, if you are, you have 247 security. 247 assurance. No fear can even enter you in the first place. Satan can't disturb your peace. There are some who die accidentally. There are some whose deaths were divinely arranged. And they knew they were going. One of him, one of such persons was Paul. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. He said, now there's laying for me a treasure in heaven, a crown. He knew his day of moving. Another person was Jesus. He prayed his last prayer. And he now said, now the hour has come. Even when Peter was doing gragra, he said, Peter, drop it. This is the time that the Son of Man must be glorified. He knew. A great man of God died in a plane crash. The day I received that news, I cried like a baby. I wept like a child. I rolled on the floor. I said, no, 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 not this man. No, no, no. Died with the wife. The man I look up to so much, I love and I revere him. And then that morning, that news got to me. And then you know my nature now. I always ask, why? God, this one, why? This one is already up there. We are even trying to reach him. It means we are not even safe. God says, shut up, my friend. Let me teach you why that happened. And I said, making inquiry to know why. And I found out. Days before that stuff, that plane crash happened, there were reports from the pilot and the engineers of the aircraft telling him that this plane cannot travel far again. Because it has been using the, you know, it has been on use for some time. And there was need for this plane to get back to wherever. And then a lot of routine check. And all that. 
carried out on it. And this man had, of course, crazy itineraries. He had ministrations. He had to attend to a lot of things. So he said, put the plane and let's move like that. Let's go by faith. Nothing will happen. Let's go. Let's go. The reason God gave you sense is so you can give him rest. There's faith, but understand there's also wisdom. Hmm. So, the man, the pilot cried and said, please sir, this thing can't go above so and so thousand meters high. It can't even try. If he tries, he's going to cry and everybody will die here. Hmm. The man said, let's go. I'm in charge. You know, those of us who are on top, who have, the reason why I stay under submission is because sometimes you take a decision, nobody will be able to tell you no, except the one you are submitting under. And sometimes, I also take my relationship so severe and serious with the Holy Ghost. Because there are sometimes, even the one you're submitting whatever, may be too far for your reach at, in most cases. And the devil is an opportunist. That's why God did not give you the Holy Ghost to walk with you. He gave you the Holy Ghost to be in you. So you can carry him with you everywhere you go. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? I can't be with you all the places. So when Jesus was here, he was Emmanuel. God with us. But when he left, he sent another one. This one is Aros Paracletos. It's God in us. God dwelling inside of us. That's the antenna. That's the antenna. You see, channels can be broadcasting news now. And I'm in my office watching channels television. Channels television station is not in my office. Though. But there's something in my office that helps me download what channels is doing. It's called a receiver. It's called an antenna. That's who the Holy Ghost is. The Holy Ghost is heaven's decoder. I don't think I'm even in the right place. I don't, some of you have abuse revelations. It's coming hot like this and you're looking as though it's a lecturer talking. That's where you miss it. So the Holy Ghost is the decoder God gave us. So at every point in time, we are not without help. We are not stranded. We are not confused. We are not in a, a state of, you enter a vehicle, you know this thing is going to happen because you hear that small, still voice. You dress up to take a journey. You hear it in your spirit. Get out of this bus. Go back home. Go tomorrow. This is the right day to move. You can hear it clearly. You don't even need to call pastor. So one of the things God told me is, People have not learned how to walk with the Holy Ghost. They have not mastered how to relate with It's a missing thing. We are going to come back with the Holy Ghost Congress. And then see how we can take five days to explain the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The most important personality. Give it to the body of Christ. But the least understood. Some people don't even know who he is. Some people don't know he's a person. They don't know he's real. A lot of you have been walking without him. Making wrong decisions without him. He can guide your choice of marriage. He can guide your choice of business. He can guide the clothes you wear. He can guide the shoe you wear. He can, he, he's, that's who he is. He's in you. He's heaven's decoder. My focus is not even on the subject of the Holy Ghost today. It's on something else. I have five minutes in the mouth. The Bible says, No, you know that you are God. Let's get back to God's sheep. If you lose that one, then he says you will die like mere men. Don't be confused. Oh, this guy is a good guy. Why come he died? Bad things happen to good people. It doesn't matter how moral you are. How good you are.
So this man took off after a series of instruction not to move. And then shoom. And of course the pilot said, okay, if we have to fly, we can't fly certain altitude. Even though we're heading for a serious crash, we're going to crash, we're going to fall from the sky. We can't operate that height. So we are going to keep it at this level. The man said, no problem. Let's keep it at that level. So the pilot kept it at a lower level. Planes don't fly that level. It's a level plane must fly. If you've ever flown before, you enter a flight. You see, when the plane takes off, even when it is in the sky, it keeps building up. It keeps building up. It keeps building up. You know what it's building into? It's building into his realm of existence. Into his realm of operation. There are realms when you operate an aircraft, that altitude cannot, it can't carry it. It will crash at that level. It can't carry it. It's just like if you put weighty substance now, maybe like stone, inside water, it must sink. You put something like paper, it floats. You get what I'm saying? It floats on the water. You see, these are two different materials. That's how planes are. Plane can't, you can't drive it on the road. Once it hits the wrong way, it's running to take off into the air. And once it hits the air, that it has flown doesn't mean it's going to stay there. It can crash. Because that's not the habitat. So when it goes up, it starts looking for its realm. Is that not what the Bible says? Building up yourself in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Why do you need to pray in the Holy Ghost? When you pray in the Holy Ghost, when you speak in tongues, you are moving into a realm of Godhead, Godship. You're moving to a realm where you begin to command things, not from the earthly realm again, but from the throne. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You begin to pray from another dimension because you can't deal with principalities and power in the flesh. So God says, build yourself first of all. Get into your realm of oppression. Get into your office. Then you begin to legislate. You begin to make decree. You begin to command. And things begin to happen. What happened finally is a disaster. These guys were operating at a level plane should not operate. And then there was a very high tower. High crane. You know these cranes that I don't know if you I, I wish I have pictures of them to show you here. High, very high crane. Ions, made of ions and all kinds of whatever. And then the pilot didn't see it in time. You know how Titanic crashed? This one iceberg that the captain didn't see in time. By the time you saw it, before they could steer the ship, it was late. That's why they have all those binoculars. So that where they can't see afar off, that helps them see afar off. And they can now take precautions quickly before the, the damage happens. So in this case, now they couldn't see quickly before they could turn the ship. It had hit the iceberg and then water floated into all the compartments and sank a heavy ship. Carrying 2,100 or something passengers, everybody died. Now, this one now flew, and then before this pilot could notice, of course, if you know the speed, plane flies on. If you know the speed, sometimes I get so astonished. Even when I'm on flight, I always ask that question How does this thing take off from here? Maybe from Inugu or anywhere. And then I'm hitting Lagos or Abuja Airport, 40 minutes. And I do my car from here to Lagos, 12 hours. And the 12 hours is when I'm doing 140. Remove all the bad road in Nigeria. You can't travel from here to Lagos within 10 hours. It's more than that. Or 9 hours. Maybe. That's if there's no bad road. There's no hold up. But I do another kind of means of transport. And I hit the airport 40 minutes. The question you have not asked is, what kind of speed is that? Is that normal speed? Before the pilot noticed that there was a crane in front of him, they had already impacted with the crane. And there was a, an explosion that took place. And all the passengers, I think about 16 or so, died. Including the anointed pastor. Anointing. 
should never substitute for the place of wisdom. It should never take the place of wisdom. It should never take the place of wisdom. And that whole family perished. And the one will be saying, is it God's will? You think everything that happens on earth is God's will? You think everything that happens is God's will? A man who dies writes a will and then dies. People can still change the will. I've seen the will of people. Wrote fine will and died. I said, my last wish, this is my will. Family came and distorted the whole thing. They don't even have respect for a last, uh, the last wish of a dead man anymore. That's what we are doing here. God's divine will. We are distorting it for lack of knowledge. Is that not the scripture say? My people have perished for what? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. And it's God's people, not Satan's people, God's people, lack of knowledge. Now, Satan is letting loose all his arsenals and emissaries, all kinds of things to see how he can collect so many people and then destroy this world before Jesus comes. And let me shock you. One of the things is launching his death. You need somebody to teach you his death. Death is one of the fastest ways he's recruiting people. Statistically, it's been proven every hour about 80,000 people die who go to hell. Every day, he said that about 350 people will die who also go to hell. Death rate has toppled at another level. And then what is even shocking is that it's with young people now. Am I preaching this thing to put fear in you? No. I'm preaching it to show you a hiding place. To show you a place of security. They said there's an outburst of yellow fever in a boy state. How many of you heard about that? And it's everywhere. Is that correct? I will only be a foolish man of God to be saying I have the divine life of God in me. Yes, I have divine life. But do you eat divine food today? When we eat the word of God, we're eating spirit food. We pray. We're eating spirit food. It takes care of the spirit man inside. You are a three-dimensional being. You are body. You are a spirit that lives in a body and that has a soul. And First Thessalonians chapter five is clear. He said, "I pray." Put it up. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-three, where it talks about your three beings being preserved and being kept blameless until the coming of the Lord. It talks about your body, your spirit, your spirit rather, your body and your soul. Can you show? It? Look at it now. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, completely. And may your whole spirit, body, soul, and body. He put them in their order of priority. The first most important part of you is your spirit. You must take care of that because that's one that helps take care of the other ones too. That's the main component of man. If I ask the real man, it's called spirit man. That's the one that will travel back to, the, to his maker when this one goes back to dust. So the spirit is the most important. You know prayer, you're joking. We put money in prayer, even in prayer. You don't know what we are doing here. Because God can't talk to a spirit that is not tuned to his frequency. You've not received the Holy Ghost baptism, evidently in praying of, in tongues. You're joking. God does not talk to your body. He does not talk through your ears. He talks through your spirit. The Holy Ghost is not in your brain. He's not in your soul. He's, he does not live in your body. He lives in your spirit. Some of you are carrying dwarf Holy Ghost. Because your spirit are dwarfed. So the man is talking, you can't understand. It's just like little babies. For instance, bring some of these most what children we have in church now. Like those small, you know, who has things in kindergarten school? And I start talking to this baby about my project. Millions of, you know, hundreds of millions of naira project I have. And this is what I want to do. She will just be looking at me. If she's not taking she will be laughing at me, Seth. What is this man even saying? 
After a while, she starts crying. She's hungry now. I've not eaten for the past two days. It's not her business. Once she's hungry, she wants to eat her food. There's nothing I'm saying to her that will make sense. That's how some of you are babies in the spirit. There's nothing the Holy Ghost is saying that you will hear. It will not make any sense to you. So the God is saying you will hear because you are a canal mind, a canal man. You can't even get instincts. You can't, you can't feel the instinct of the Holy Ghost telling you stop. This direction you're going will lead you to your end. Stop. You won't hear it. So, he said, spirit, take care of it. And I'm not here to talk about that. So, hey, don't be a dollar. Don't be a fool. Don't be an, an ignorant man. Work on your soul. Work on your brain. Work on your mind. Get wisdom. Get knowledge. When you go to secular school, you don't go to train your spirit. The educational sector trains the soul. When you read books, you train the soul. You go for seminars, you are dealing with the soul. When you come to church, we deal with the spirit man. But, there's a third one. He said body. He said, preserve that one also. Because God is not a fool by giving you a body. He made it out of the dust of the earth. But that is the house of your spirit. That means no matter what God wants to do with you and through you to affect your generation, if your body is gone, your spirit can do nothing here. Spirits are not permitted to operate on the earth. That's why when the body drops, they go back to where they operate. They go back to their habitats. If you want to travel to the moon or travel to space, you don't go with your body. You wear a different kind of body. It's called space body. What you call space jacket or space suit. If you want to live in the water, you don't go with your body. You don't have the organs that can harness the habitat. You go with what you call marine suits or marine jackets. You must wear fins. You carry oxygen at the back. Your legs will carry some shoes that enables you to fly or to swim. I watch some of these natural geo channels. I see how they travel down to the ocean bed. I mean, to the very bed of the ocean. And some can even sit down there eating. Remove those clothes from that guy now. If you know the ocean tides, if you know the horror of water, you don't even know what we're talking about. If you know the terror of water, it can bust you open. Bust your whole what You work with EEDC. When, some, when you guys go for some of this special work you do, I see some of you wear helmets. You wear boots. You wear hand gloves. Because that's a different habitat. As expert as, as, expert as he may be, he carries out his hand now and go and touch that high tension. If you see what, where it will land him. With everything he knows, he's also taught how to take precaution. Before he enters maybe transformer, or he enters a particular danger, whatever, he's, there's a particular dressing he needs to wear. Maybe a helmet, particular tools he needs to use. You know, because I have knowledge on how to connect this red and yellow wire and black wire, he uses his hand to do that. No. There are other hands created for that job. The hands are called spanner, screwdrivers, and chisels and tools, or whatever you call them. Those are the hands that can touch those cables, and nothing happens to them. But you use your body that is not designed for it, and thought it can dry your whole blood and kill you immediately. So the creative frame body is for these things. I want to fly now to Lagos. I don't have wings. What do I do? Submit my body now to another body. I submit both my spirit, my body, and my soul to a fourth body. That fourth body is called an aircraft. Others take bus, others take, take taxi or whatever. When I submit to an aircraft, that aircraft becomes the body. That's why once I enter that aircraft, there are rules that are given before they take off. And I must respect the rules. 
I don't go saying I'm a spirit being. I'm so anointed. I'm so powerful. So I don't need to respect the rules of uh, what do you call it? Aeronautic rules or what do you call it? Aerodynamic rules. So I entered there. They say fasting your seatbelt. I must fasten. In cases of emergency, they say, draw out your nose mask and then pull like this. I must draw. I don't stay there and say, if not, I'm going to be depleted of air, of oxygen. I th they say, turn off your phone. And I turn it off. Because I can damage my life and the person next to me. That's not to start doing video call. They say, take a breast, whatever position, and know what I take all that position. They say, no smoking is allowed in this, whatever. No matter how addicted you are to smoking, you will dare not pull a stick of cigarettes. Even the man who is addicted to cigarettes doesn't even pull one stick out. No alcohol on the on flight, on board the flight. You dare not bring out your whatever. You hold your addiction until you are out of that body. There are times you can't lose your seatbelt. Until that plane reaches its cruising state, you can now pull all those stuff off. After a while, you can now walk around and go to ease yourself. But when you see at that takeoff stage, you dare not do that. You can roll off that whatever and break your nose somewhere or break your body somewhere. Because I'm in a new environment, I'm in a new body. And I must respect the rules governing that body. That's how it is now. I have a body. The body God gave my spirit is this body I'm wearing. This is God's own body for carrying the spirit. Men have created their own body. But you have God's own kind of body. The one he created. This earthly body. You have space body. You have marine body. But you also have earthly body which God gave you to help you fulfill your destiny. The one who is fulfilling destiny is not your body, it's your spirit. The one with the vision is not your body, it's your spirit. The one with the purpose is not your body, it's your spirit. But the one designed to help it, to carry it, to be the vehicle that will lead it to its promised land is the body. So God also says, respect your body. He said, keep it blameless. Preserve it. Diseases can destroy it. Accident can destroy it. Some recklessness can destroy it. You want to climb Okada. You didn't check the Okada man you are climbing. Sometimes even when I'm talking, I know it's been long I left that level of Okada and Keke and all that. But at least I still have some little experience. You want to climb Okada and then the man opens his mouth. You perceive alcohol and you still climb. You enter a bus and see this man's eyes is red with Igbo. And you still enter. He said, preserve your body. So now they say there's an outbreak of, what do you call it? Yellow fever. There's an outbreak of hepatitis B or whatever they call it. And then you say, I should be claiming anointed man of God. Hey, that anointing doesn't work in foolishness. The anointing of God on me works when I do not know. If I'm not aware of something, eh, hey, that's when God can do. But now that I have knowledge, God can go to rest. If God knows I now have knowledge and I'm still relying on the supernatural, you'll be so shocked when the thing hits you. A great man, my name of Archbishop Idaosa, went to be with the Lord. Died at the very, I think, 59 or so, if I'm correct, or 50 something. He died. So anointed, raised a lot of people back from the grave. Dead people came back to life. All kinds of things happened through his ministry. But a man died. Too much of travel, no rest, and all that. It didn't impact on his body. Do you know the shocking? When the man died, they said they preserved his body for some time, put him in, you know, they didn't put him inside the ground. They put him in a particular kind of tomb. They said for those few years he was in that tomb, that people who were sick will go there and pray and get healed. Anyone who goes here on any kind of excursion, touch the whatever, they get healed instantly. There was still anointing on the body. 
But the man is dead. Because the anointing on that body, the anointing on that vessel is not for the man. It's for people. Elisha died. His bones were broken. He was in a grave. The whole body had dried up. Only the bones. And then there were people who were dead from a particular war, whatever. And they were taking them into the graves. You know, just mass burial, pouring them. And then there were a few that happened to contact with the bones of Elisha. The moment they contacted with the bone, a surge left the bone and hit the body. They came back to life. A man dies and he's decayed. The bone is in the grave, but still has power inside. When somebody was asking me, why was there too much of power in the bones of Gehazi, in the bones of Elisha? I say, Elijah transferred double to Elisha. So he was carrying too much of power. But not just that he was carrying double. He was carrying triple that he didn't transfer to Gehazi. So what he took to the grave was Gehazi's portion. Where Elijah transferred double to Elisha. Elisha was supposed to trans transfer triple. If you ask me for double portion of my anointing, and I put double on you, what are you carrying now? It's triple because you have an anointing also. So if I now transfer to Gehazi, what do I transfer? Triple. If it comes on Gehazi, what does he have? Quaplet. Too much power in the bones. And then it was raising dead people. But the man himself was dead. So, I heard about a vaccine that is going around town, vaccinating people from what do you call it? Yellow fever. Endemic. Do I have yellow fever? No. Will I get it? No. But now that I know, don't go and be sleeping. What do I do? I go there. And line up like other people. Anointed man of God. If there's anybody sick there now, in that same spot, I lay hands, you'll be healed. Oh. Healing minister like me. You'll be healed instantly. Dear. When I went and submitted my... He got to my turn. He said, sir, we'll give it to you at the right hand here. I said, is that so? I said, that means I was wearing a long sleeve. I said, that means I need to pull this thing. Broad daylight, where line was I? Pulled my clothes with my singlet. I submitted my hand. The lady had to put the needle there and vaccinated me. I said, Sir, you may also need to do hepatitis B test. I said, I'll come tomorrow and do that one. No problem. I know I don't have it, but I'll do it. So that when I'm through blocking every channel the devil is looking for, if he finally finds his way in, I now know what to deploy. It's a supernatural. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? I want to show you wisdom that will help you. Ah, God help my time. How can young men be safe in an evil day where the devil is stealing souls? Apart from the issue of wisdom, you know, because there are elements God has shown me. One of the things is trying people, you see issues of wisdom, issues of the blood, the blood covenant. We will need to get back to the teachings on the power of the blood. So you know how to... Then there are teachings on wisdom. But, the first side I want to deal with now, in brief, is the side that deals with God. That was why I said, find that scripture. The name of the Lord is a strong word, tower. The righteous runs into it and is what? Safe. That means you can be righteous outside the name of the Lord. You are not safe. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Yes. The righteous rose into it. Righteous. So you can be righteous and outside God's hiding place. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What is shocking? What is shocking? So you can be a Christian and not have a secret place. And not be in the secret place of the Most High. So that means these things are not automatic. The name of the Lord is not automatic. Secret place of the Most High is not automatic. That you are born again doesn't mean you are already there. You can have a family and be a vagabond. And be a fugitive. Your father has a duplex, has house. Oh, you are outside the house. Have you not seen people like that? What do you think happened to the prodigal son? Where was he eating the food of swines and pigs? See estate the father has. See where he is. 
can have a strong tower. Okay, it's up already. Proverbs 18 verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong word. Tower. Strong tower. That's a strong building. You know what tower is? Mm. Tower. It's usually very high. That means if the devil climbs to get you where you are, it will be so difficult. He can't even get close. If he even tries the security, would have caught him. See, it's a strong tower. They say the righteous runs, no strolls into it. No walks into it. They run into it. They run into it. They run. If we're still begging you to come to church, you are playing with your life. If we're still begging you to be serious with God, you are playing with your life. It didn't say the righteous drags their leg into it. It's not the righteous is followed up into it. It's not the righteous is uh, cajoled into it. He said the righteous makes a deliberate decision to run into it. This is where the security. Outside it, I'm finished. It's not religion. It's not bearing one Christian name. And deceiving yourself on Facebook. That you are a Christian. You are ten sisters and so church. It's not about um, dressing Christianized. It's about running into the name of the Lord. The righteous runs to it and are what? Save. Wow. So you see how God answers my questions. He just shows me what I need to do. As you live here tonight, one of the things I want you to leave asking yourself is, what is my commitment with God? Am I a hanky-panky Christian? On and off Christian? Fair-weather Christian? The devil is a hunter. You know, sometimes we teach some stupid, stupid things. We teach grace, what God has done, and we don't teach people responsibility. The gospel of grace does not leave us without responsibility. In fact, the gospel of grace should teach us responsibility. Hello? Paul is the greatest apostle and teacher of grace I know. Do you know what he said in one scripture? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So what it means is that that you have grace doesn't mean you should be irresponsible. The effectivity of grace or the effectiveness of grace is activated with responsibility. When you live a responsible life, grace increases on your life anyhow. My nurse responsibility, you would finish grace. You would finish grace. Finish grace. Or you have it in abundance though. But irresponsible life can deplete it. So sometimes we are taught some jargons. We don't balance these things. We think, okay, God is the one responsible to us. God is the one responsible for us. God is the one responsible for us. But I check, this same God didn't carry you to church this evening. This same God didn't dress you up this evening. This same God will not come down and put food in your mouth. You would feed yourself. He plays his part, but you must play your part. That's sonship. There must be a balance. So we think this is automatic. The moment we are saved, okay, God starts doing everything for us. He starts looking after us, looking at our back. You know, he has our back and all that. And then we just go about our life anyhow we want. Thinking God is a magician that just delivers us from all nonsense. No, God says, hey, run into. And then you are saved. You can't be outside and expecting me to take care of you there. Run into here. And then you are safe. You've seen where chicks are picked by hawk. Have you seen one picked outside the mother hen's covering? Is it possible? Oh. So the ones that are picked were picked where? Outside. There's one scripture. Just last scripture to back up this. I want to show you. 
show them Psalm chapter 23. Very popular scripture. I love this one. Ponder on this. Then I'll now close with Ecclesiastes. <laughs> The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then now, verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Are you seeing the issue? He leads me beside the still waters. If you do not give God room in your life. Go to verse 4. Okay. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4. Yea. Now, are you seeing that evil will come the devil will attempt to. He's going to try to raise his ugly head. But see your assurance now. The one that you've given the right to be shepherd over your life. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because every day you're walking through that valley. That's what you don't know. Every day. Every day. I say every day. Including me. Every day. Oh, you think Satan wakes up in the morning and says, keep all these people alive today. Tomorrow is their turn. Every day the devil sees you, it's your turn to die. Our security is the name of the Lord. Is somebody here what I'm saying? When a criminal sees you, does he postpone taking something from you? What does the Bible say about the devil? He cometh not but to steal, to kill, destroy. He's such a rugged man. You think if he sees you now, he say, wait, wait, wait for me. Let me go. I forgot uh, the hammer who used to hammer your head. And he goes away a little to go. No. Anything he finds around there, he uses on you. So God did a divine arrangement here. My friend. You're walking through valleys of shadow of death every day. When you're in the market, you don't know where you are. When you're in the school, you don't know where you are. You think you're just in school. Cold boys can open fire. Bah, the bullet is on you. And then you're not prepared for it. You enter the vehicle, the driver you don't know from anywhere. The vehicle you don't know the last time it was serviced. You enter thinking the vehicle was performing well. All of a sudden, four tires boy, explode and the whole vehicle is the other way. I found out when God has become your strong tower, even when the tire wants to burst. <laughs> Why do we have angels? Angels can sustain the tires until you reach your destination. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Oh, Jesus understood that stuff. And there's a scripture for it. You will show them. I think it's in Isaiah. He will give his angels charge over you. When, I'm through this one. when the devil was tempting Jesus, he said to him, jump, jump, jump from the pinnacle. For the scripture says he will give his angels charge over you. Lest you dash your feet on the stone. But Jesus answered him accurately. Do not tempt God. Get wisdom and get it well. Know what you are meant to be doing at the right time and do it well. Then when all has been done and then it looks like, oh God, what's going on here? God now becomes that safest place. You know, the hands of God now becomes that whole old place where you are safe and kept secure. No devil can touch you there. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Don't play yourself out of the hand of God. And say, God, save me now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we fear no evil. So I've checked. None of these things is my fault. I mean, other. He said, For you are with me. Your rod, discipline, and your staff, comfort, love, comfort me. Your rod, discipline. Do you know sometimes God is trying to get a guy in shape? It's through discipline. <laughs> See something hanging over your life to destroy you. His discipline is going to bring. Sometimes it's not going to be encouragement, stuff. Sometimes it's not going to be counsel, stuff. Sometimes it's going to be a rod, discipline, chastisement. 
It's going to fire you. That lateness you've been coming to church. It's just like I was asking somebody. I've studied it for the past one month or beyond. But I've kept track of it for the past one month. Every Wednesday, it rains from after five. And then I was asking somebody, has any other person noticed this thing like I've noticed? And I would say, do you know what God is trying to say? Do you know anything after five is lateness to church? Service starts five. Why is that God doesn't send the rain by 4.30? He doesn't even send the rain by five. The clouds starts getting even darkened by five o'clock. Warning sign. Run into the house. Somebody is in the house expecting to come to church by 5.15, by 5.30. Rain starts falling by that time. He can't come again. What is God trying to teach you? You are a foolish virgin. Have you not studied the scripture? And see that story of the woman, the women, the ten virgins. Five were wise. They had their oil in their lamp. And then they had enough to be born in until the master of the ceremony came. The other ones had no oil. They went out to go and buy oil and the master came. By the time they came back, they said, get out. You're foolish people. The wedding has started. You're not permitted here. And then they were shut out of the hall. So how can a person who is in church by 4.30 be caught up in that rain? How can a person who is in church by 4.15, sorry, by uh, 4.45, 4.50 even, be caught up in that rain? So you wait in your house or wait in your business premises, wait until it is past 5, and then the heavy downpour comes. I said to that person, God is trying to teach the church something, and we don't get it. I've observed it. Sometimes it's Wednesday service, the thing just comes like that. And somebody said, what kind of devil is that? I said, shut up. Don't blame the devil for everything. It's not Satan. It's God trying to show us a sign. It's trying to review your responsibility. Now look at the information coming here. See how many people are cut off. Look at the news coming here now. See how many people are cut off. That same ring. But you see the guys are breathing in tongue. You think this guy is already in heaven. A foolish Christian. He has no sense. When God gives time appointment, he plays with it. A politician gives, he keeps it. God is saying that's a fool. No politician's name has been given by which man can be saved. Only one name has been given by which man shall be saved. And that name is the name of Jesus. At the mention of that name, every knee should bow. That's the only name given. You know? That's the only name that saves. And when that man gives an appointment, you play with it. You're the greatest foolish Christian in the world. That's why when people die all the nonsense that they die, people are crying on Facebook, wailing up and down. And I say, you don't even know where the guy touched the wrong button. Morality is not Christianity. I want to say it again. I'm a good boy. It's not Christianity. I'm a good guy. It's not Christianity. What is your work with God like? Talking about your work with God. Your work with God. Down to the issue of time. When is God's time? How do you treat it? Do you treat it like it's nothing? Because you don't see him. But that same name is the greatest tower that is. The righteous runs into it. And is safe. As you go home tonight, go home thinking about your commitment with God. Is it a shallow commitment? Is it a passive commitment? Is it a careless commitment? Or is it a deep one? God may have given somebody some warning here. Warning and warning and warning. Take me serious. Take me serious. And you're playing hanky-panky with him. Continue. And finally, I don't have all the time. Get back to Ecclesiastes. After, you know, maybe on Sunday I'll do a brief one on this in the first service. And then... Um, now, no, 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 no. Go to verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days, those words come. Stop calling God when difficult days come. You should have been calling him before the difficult days come. You see, some of you were telling, pray, 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 pray. You're waiting until disaster hits. You start praying. You don't know anything. You don't... You, 
you don't wait to pray when things go bad pray when times are good though because it's that time you need to have had the bad times from coming you don't pray because things have gotten tough that means god is a spare part you change your tire when you know there's something i do i drive some suvs so i am wise enough to know when to do tire swap there are times i do it my tire has not busted or nothing went wrong with the tire i just go to michelin pack it there and then tell them swap the tires they swap the four tires in most cases the tire expires and i look at the expiry date at least it has expired though okay maybe i even just manage drive it for one month or two months after a while i go back to the michelin Change this whole tire. My, one of my SUVs parking in the house, I've not driven it out. Not because he has any, his tire. One of the tires busted and they went and changed another tire that is not exactly that one. The other three. I've refused to drive it up to you now. I don't do that. you never see any of my vehicle having different tires. They must be the same and the manufacturing date must be the same. I don't take that stupid risk. I left it. Who is that guy who changed it? Was it not you who changed it? Who bought that tire? Eh, so you, you're a witness already. I left the car. Ever since he changed the tire, I left it there. I've not been using that one. So now what it means, I'll go and change the whole four. If I, can't, I can't be using three older and then one newer. It has to be newer altogether the same day. That's how it used tire. Wait, not the one with me. Then when I change the tire, the whole four at once I changed. So I don't wait until this boa tire has busted before I start looking for remedy. <laughs> That's why I wake up in the morning. I check my hydraulic. I check my engine oil level. I check my water. I check a few nitty gritties. You don't wait until it starts showing you red lights. Some of you wait until the red light hits. God, oh God, God, where are you now? Say you say you never leave me. You are a covenant keeping God. Where are you there now? God, where are you? He has gone far. Attending to serious human beings, not foolish Christians. Where you should be more prayerful is when things are okay. Not when things are rough. Some of you, it's when things are rough. That's when you start coming to church every day. You attend all day. But when things are swelling nice, that's when you should be giving God your most quality time. All the prayer meetings you should be attending. All the cell meetings you should be attending. When you notice your business is skyrocketing and going up, that's when your intimacy with God should increase because success attracts Satan. When you arise, Satan does not give you space. Oh, is you know where the carcass is that the vultures gather? So Christians get careless when they are suddenly making it. That's when they abandon God. They run away from church. They start giving stupid excuses. If you see what the devil is cooking out there for you, he said before the evil days. Before the evil days, the difficult days come. And our translation use evil days, not even difficult days. Evil days. He said, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. And of course, go back and read the other ones. We read them before. Go and study them again. You will find out the remedy to all this nonsense going on in these last days is putting God first in your life. He says, remembering God. Remember your God. Now that a lot of you here are very young people, give God first place in your life. Don't make God a spare part, a spare tire. The one you change when something is wrong. You have gone around and blown your life, destroyed your life, burnt your opportunities. Then when you now have whatever crisis, you start running looking for pastor, running looking for God. God, help me, oh. Throwing tantrum on God. God, if you don't do anything, I will leave this church. I will backslide, though. Backslide. God has very serious business to attend to. You're not the only one he created. Some of you here, you can't even, I'm not sure you have, to, those of you who are not married, don't even have target of up to two children. Some of you are trusting God for even one or two. Because you know how demanding, how many do you have now, sir? One. Hey, I know how demanding can be. 
just to look after one alone. The way you now have two, when you have three. Now, don't even cross three. Let me advise you guys. So you can imagine a God who is father of more than 7.2 billion people attending to them at the same time. And you are the one giving him problem. God, I'm back. No. I can, I can imagine him saying, tear down Nuku to backslide. Let him backslide and go to hell. Go and sit down one place. Solomon had 1,000 women in his life. 700 concubines, 300 wives. As a serious human being. Trying to help God. You can imagine how many children he had. Even the Bible didn't tell us because the figures would have been... They were not sure. So they kept that one and told us the one they were sure. How can a man be walking around his palace and a young boy runs to him and say, Good morning, sir. Good morning, your royal highness. He says, Yes, good morning. Your face looks familiar. He says, Yes, sir. He says, Who are you? He says, My name is Desmond. Desmond who? Desmond Solomon. Desmond Solomon. Are you saying I'm your father? He says, Yes, you're my father, sir. He says, Hey, wow. I'm meeting you for the first time. So who is your mother? My mom is uh, Nkiroka. Nkiroka, Nkiroka. Is she my wife or my concubine? <laughs> Which of them? Say, sir, it's your wife. Say, hey, where did I marry that one from? Say, from Mbitonu. Say, Mbitonu. Is that in Imo State? He say, yes. Say, hey. Well, let me, not, let me not bore you with the questions. Nice to meet you, my son. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, my son. Can you imagine that? Solomon had that problem. And God has 7.2 billion people or more looking up to him. Remember your creator. If you were created by this God, give him first place. No devil will snatch you. There is only security in God. There is protection in God. When you go home, read Psalm 91, you will see what he has to say. There is preservation in God. Nothing runs into the name of the Lord and is destroyed. I'm sure on Sunday you want to hear some more wisdom. There are things I will tell you. Sunday, I'm going to do some nuggets, you know. Some safety nuggets. 101 safety nuggets. So maybe I'll give it to them within the week so they can type it and project it. You won't be tired if you miss the service on Sunday. Because I'm just going to be giving you tips, PowerPoints, before I get into the main teaching on the issue of it. How many of you have ever seen me when you stop bike? Maybe we are together. And you stop bike. And I tell you, instruct the bike man, oh, tell him to be careful. Have you ever heard me say that? Yes, you want to climb bike. I said, tell your bike man to be very careful. He shouldn't drive anyhow. If he overspeeds, knock him from the back. Tell him to calm down. Sometimes I'm driving, I see some of you, even in maybe your tricycles or bike, this speed. Vroom, vroom, and I'm like, See, is that lady mad? It's not the bike man that is my problem. Now it's you who is a kingdom, a Zionist, a Zion person who should have sense. So today's own, I've dealt with this issue of committing yourself back to God. Commit back to fellowship. Commit to communion. Commit to... You see this when is the services we have. Some of you think, is it not evening service? You don't know what evening service can save in your destiny. You think it's just evening service so I can treat it with levity and then take Sunday service serious. Don't worry. You know, evil days don't only come on Sunday. It's every day. Me, I fellowship with God every day. It's not a once in a while. Take Bible study serious. But personal Bible study, personal prayer life, personal worship life, fellowship, all those stuff. Take them serious. Pray often in the Holy Ghost. Your antennas will be too high to perceive when danger is coming. You will hear from God often. The Holy Ghost will minister to you often. Take spiritual authority serious. Because God is not an author of confusion. He knows why he puts those structures in the kingdom. Spiritual authority. It's an all times to be attacking your pastor. It's an all times to be rebelling against authority. It's an all times to be manufacturing stupid excuses. It's an all time to allow familiarity to blindfold you. You only get that, you know, happen to your detriment. 
I have a man of God I submit under and I listen to him. He cautions me, I listen. He commands me, I obey. Because in this kingdom, God builds using the father's son order. Can't you see Job? Satan couldn't touch him until he took permission from headquarters. Can't you see God couldn't even talk to Samuel until he took permission from Eli? It's not an order of confusion. If he has given you an authority, a spiritual authority, be careful how you relate with that man. You're under a great covenant here. Don't abuse it. Honor that channel God has placed over your life. Not just honor with words, honor with substance, honor in your heart, honor with some. This generation don't know what having a pastor is. They don't know it. It's a generation that plays with the anointing, that plays with men of God. Can go on Facebook and talk anyhow. You see, men of God as normal human beings. You don't know they are angels. And God gave them to keep watch over your soul. Show that scripture. That's the last one. Is that not Hebrews? I don't know again, no. For they are like people who will give account over your souls. He said, let, okay, those who minister or whatever, oversee whatever, let them do it with joy. Find it. Why am I forgetting that stuff? No, 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 no. That's the scripture I shouldn't forget. Do you know the scripture I'm talking about? Eh? I was even talking to some people about that scripture a few days ago. I oh, yeah, madam, give me the scripture quickly. Find it. I know it's not in First Thessalonians, the one that talks about um... eh? Yes, Hebrews is Hebrews what? 1317, that is correct. You are right about that. That even when God has given you a shepherd, given you a pastor giving you an authority, spiritual, he has given you covering. You don't just say, okay, God, it's you I need. I, I don't play with you, Lord. So, if you play with the man he has put over you, you can, <laughs> he that breaketh the hedge and serpent will bite. This generation is the most traumatized by Satan because they don't understand how God ordained things to walk in the kingdom. You're confused by all kinds of independent, self, egocentric, driven messages. Motivation everywhere. So you don't know other in the kingdom again. But in your house, you have a father. You have a mother. You didn't bring yourself here. You have rules and regulations in school. You have a vice chancellor. You have a, lect a dean in your faculty. You have a HOD in your department. Then you have lecturers. Course lecturers. In the plane, you have a pilot who is the captain of the plane. And you submit. You go to hospital, you submit to the doctor. Say, tell me everything. Tell me the truth. You tell the whole truth. Some of you live in hostels. You have hostel presidents. Some of you live in compounds. You have caretakers. And they even have rules that regulate the, the, the compound. We shut down our gate at 9 o'clock. You come and knock from that tomorrow. Nobody opens it this day. How come you obey every... You see authorities all over you. You're going out tomorrow morning now. Drive and reach the roundabout. You see a man in yellow clothes doing your hand like this to stop. You stop. Even lights too has authority now. It shows red light. You stop your car. You wait oh, until... Eh, like the one that happened to me today in Enugu. Driving out of somewhere. And then I was trying to catch up with an appointment. I didn't even see that traffic light. God is my witness. I didn't see it. So I didn't know I was one minute before the red light. So after the red light turned on. I didn't know. And then behold another traffic there. So I stopped. I did that traffic because I could see this one clear. Hmm. These traffic guys just came with their power bikes and double crossed me. And they say, if you see the English is full, sir, please, we uh, observe that you broke traffic rules, so we'd like to play the video for you. If you confirm it's your car and confirm that you're the one that broke the rule, we will now instigate the necessary whatever. But if it is not yours, we'll allow you to go. I said, why not? Come into the car. In my heart, I said, see a nugu has turned Yankee. They opened the car. The guy entered. 
and used his phone. I'm telling the truth. And played me the video. I saw my car. I don't know how they caught it. They saw, I saw. I said, that's not my car. You said, that's my car. He said, is this not your car, sir? I said, play it again. They played it, and they now did slow motion. Played on slow motion. And I saw it. I looked at the plate number. I said, it's my car. It's okay. So this is the fine. And guess what I paid, though? After much beg, 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 I plead. I say, I'm a man of God. I'm just coming from, you know, with my wife and all that. Can't you understand? He says, sir, but this is, okay, based on this, okay, pay this. I say, well, no problem. I, I, I understand the law and how it works. I paid the money. Even the who anointed me. See traffic lights brought me to book. Lights. Oh. The scripture says, if we so know how to obey it, okay, there's one that talks about giving to Caesar what is Caesar and giving to God what is God, pay your tributes to all men, blah, blah, blah. But there's another one that talks about the fathers of our spirit. The fathers of our spirit. The fathers of our spirit. We'll come to that later. Maybe I will look for those scriptures and I'll show you. We'll look at this one finally. So you know how important spiritual authority is. Obey those who rule over you. Are you seeing it here? And be submissive. For they watch out for your words. Hello. So what does your pastor do? So that means Satan cannot get you until he gets permission from me. Hello. Maybe I said it in small letter. I want to say it in capital letter now. So it will enter. What I'm saying is that I have power to give Satan permission over your life. And I have power to get him out of your life. Before you think that we are the same because our face looks similar, you have to understand what I'm saying. Before you think we are the same because I, wear, I wore the same material you're wearing, you have to get sense now. I understand that when a man of God has been removed out of men and consecrated unto God and then the, the authority of priesthood has been invested in him he is carrying the authority and the oracles of God he is God's representative he said and be submissive so this thing won't work until you are obedient and submissive those of you who have come let me announce it to all of you here if you don't want to enter trouble if you go home tonight, assess, Lord, have I become too familiar with this man? Has he become like a mortal to me? Has he become a mere man to me? If you find out that has happened in your life, but you can't repent from that, I would advise you in all honesty, you better find yourself another house. Because my covering can't rest on you. Take it as truth, bitter truth. You better do. Because you'll be fooling yourself. Any day the thing strikes, it will get you. Okay. They will watch out for your souls as those who must give accounts. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be what? Unprofitable for you. So some church people have entered buses and died in accidents. You don't know why. Not that they offended God. Though. They offended their pastor. Please, before everybody, anybody criticize me on social media or take this except and begin to talk nonsense, see that I've shown you in the Bible. It's in your Bible. And there are many more backups to that claim. From the same scripture. I see people who get up and enter bus. Bam! Traveling. Pastor does not know their whereabouts. And then something happens on the road. Criminal gets them on the road. Rapes them on the road. Destroy their life on the road. Because your covering was not where you were traveling. Some is rebellion like this. Nobody can talk to them. Nothing can correct them in this way. So high-minded. So stubborn and proud. Says unprofitable for you. It's just like now I have messages my pastor, Pastor David Willie, sent me. I mean, he calls me, gives me instruction. Hey, it's like God is the one talking. Hmm. 
now he has given me a date i must report to lagos i had to look at that date more than three times nothing in heaven or in hell can stop me because instruction eliminates destruction appear in lagos so so and so dates i look at it carefully there's no schedule you are giving me on planet earth i don't care even if it's with donald trump donald trump does not keep watch over my soul that man keeps watch over my soul there are things that may be happening to me i don't know god will go and show him because if god shows me i can't deal with it myself he has to show somebody who is more mature who is more spiritually grounded who has more muscles in the spirit to be able to handle them for me so sometimes we think these things are given for for the benefit of the pastor you don't know it's to your benefit you don't see this mother chick mother hen when they are carrying all those children on that do you know how much the woman has to stretch down her wings to cover all those children you think it's sweet when she's fertilizing those eggs incubating 21 days she's sitting on, you think it's sweet you think she doesn't want to be run up and down The price will pay. If you allow me, I want to throw the whole price away. I have my life normal. See it now. The things I saw going on over Facebook is what tell us this message. Did you think like this? Who thought like this? Who has brought the message to you? The same pastor. Yesterday, when I got the information about the vaccine, the first thing I thought about was the church. I had to go today with this man and went with my wife to go and collect my own. Because some people even collected behind us and then they even informed the general whatever. I went and collected my own and I told them, arrive here at 10 o'clock tomorrow and come and do for my people. So I had to pull the whole vaccine, whatever. Tomorrow, if you have not done your vaccination, 10 o'clock they'll be here. What has the man done? When you are in your house sleeping, see him going around looking for your souls. So if you've not done your own, 10 o'clock they'll be here. I've gone to pull them down here. 10 o'clock in the morning, come here and come and surrender your right hand. They'll give you that vaccination and then all that nonsense, you know, if you can't get close to you. And then they'll do some hepatitis B test. If it's negative, wow. If they, whatever is there, they give you some three days dose that will clear the nonsense. And then there are times it's prayers. The times is sitting down to study in depth. The times I look at your face and I start asking God, why is he that way? Why is he looking that way? And then I call you close to, hey, you don't know what you have when you have a pastor. Especially a genuine one who teaches you and feeds you with the word. Especially a genuine one. You don't know what you have. You play with it. You play with your destiny, my friends. That's why God says you should put double honor on them. Because you can't pay them for what they do. Put double on on them. Glory to God. You may need to bow your heads a few seconds and talk to God. Lord, help me to hide myself in the hollows, the hollows, the hollows, the hollows of your hand. This season, I don't want anything to confuse me. I want to remember my creator. Now that I'm young, I don't want any distraction. I don't want anybody to deceive me this season. I don't want anybody to confuse me this season with cares and worries, material things, uh, whatever you may call it. I want to keep my gaze on you. If you need to repent from some nonsense, go ahead and repent tonight. Lord, I repent from carelessness, recklessness. I repent from, from taking you on, from, from being on serious with you. I repent from doing things my own way. I repent from being a pretender. I repent from being, from being you know, some things that were put in your hands in church died because of you. Because of you. Because you take God like your mates. But God is still faithful. Still burning resources to keep you. The air you breathe is not your own. The life you live is not your own. Some of you can't even pray. Because your life only revolves around you. Stand on your feet everywhere you are and talk to God. I feel sorry for men who toy with God. You don't know what you're toiling with. Life is like vapor. 
today you see the vapor wave in a few seconds is gone that's what life is like it's but a vapor it's but a vapor it's but a vapor that's why you must take God serious nothing compares to him oh. no itinerary no engagement can take his place in my life I don't care with who the engagement is if it is with God I can get anything out of the way to spend time with him he's my all in all he's my everything he's my everything he is my everything. He that has kept me alive up to this point. He deserves all my worship. He deserves all my praise. He deserves my money. He deserves my resources. He deserves everything. He deserves everything. self-centeredness is what makes a man lose that heart of gratitude to god self-centered living is what makes a man never think <laughs> my dream is to please god i have no other dream in life that's my greatest ambition How can you say you are in love with God yet you can't talk to him? You can't pray. If only you can open your mouth and pray this evening, I think God will be a little bit happy. All you need to do is first of all be thankful and be grateful to him. We hope you've been blessed by the timely word by Pastor Prince Abba. We'd like to hear your testimony. Visit us today at Kristen Hills Church, located anywhere around you, or call 070 87 44 nine one nine two or zero eight one three seven two zero zero six zero eight also visit our website at www.christianhills.org and follow us on all social media handles at Kristen Hills Church Kristen Hills Church raising global vegans